All right, it's 12.01. I think people are still jumping on, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I guess, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Zach Snyder, and I'm a program manager at the nonprofit Solar Oregon. This is our How to Go Solar and Storage webinar. It's a recurring webinar. Um, very excited that you're joining us today and excited to talk about the process of how to go solar and storage. We are going to cover a few topics. We're going to start with a look at how solar energy works, the technology, including uh, solar panels and net metering. Then we'll talk a little bit about what makes a site good for solar. There's all sorts of aspects of your home or business uh, that can make it easier or less easy to go solar. We're going to cover those. Then we'll talk about energy storage, which is uh, an increasingly uh, hot topic, a uh, topic of interest. And then we will talk all about the incentives available. We'll go over a couple of example budgets, and we will finish off by talking about how to get started on your solar journey, finding contractors and uh, what the installation process looks like. So I'm excited to cover all of that. And we will uh, finish with a Q&A, which is always my favorite part. So uh, if you have questions, maybe you have questions already uh, that you brought here today, uh, definitely keep track of those. I'm going to show you the uh, Q&A button here in a second, how to, how to ask those, uh, but we'll be covering those at the end. This is a recently updated uh webinar uh, we did a lot of work to make sure that we have the the latest and most up-to-date information from uh about the market and what's going on in solar so i'm excited to share that with you uh, we also added some new content uh particularly about energy storage and uh, the webinar now runs a little bit north of 50 minutes itself but we'll be uh, i'll be staying on uh for q a uh if you are able to stay on uh, however long you would like to stay on after that point. So let me start with a little bit of information about Solar Oregon. We are a 43-year-old nonprofit. We work to educate and advocate to increase the adoption of solar energy and other forms of related consumer uh, clean energy, like energy storage, electric vehicles, efficiency. We do that through our How to Go Solar and Storage, which is this program. We do this a couple times a month, so feel free to join us again in the future. We also put on solar tours, and we have a big solar uh, zero energy homes tour uh, in that is uh, in person in Portland. And we do have some sites usually that are around the state. That's a lot of fun. That's in October. Uh, we host Solarize campaigns, and we do a lot of peer to peer education. If you are a member, thank you so much. We are a member supported nonprofit. Uh, and so uh, that's a great way to support our work. Uh, if you like what we do and want to uh, help us to uh, get more solar in Oregon, uh, I just dropped some links in the chat. I'll refer back to those throughout the webinar, uh, but you can see links to our website, our upcoming events, uh, donation page, and any support is appreciated. Also, thank you to the Energy Trust of Oregon. They are an independent nonprofit that works to uh, increase the uh, efficiency uh, and increase renewable energy in our grid uh, for the customers of Portland General Electric, Pacific Power, and the large gas utilities as well. They do a lot of things around the state. Uh, they offer incentives for solar uh, and uh, other technologies. And they also support educational programming like this series. So a big thank you to Energy Trust of Oregon. Now, a couple of items of housekeeping. Uh, this Q&A button that I was mentioning, if you don't see your menu, you might have to mouse over your screen, uh, but you will then see a menu bar. Uh, you have a chat button and a Q&A button. Please use the uh, Q&A to ask your questions. You can start asking questions right now. Uh, again, we're gonna hit those at the end of the webinar. You can ask them throughout the, uh, the webinar, just type them in. The chat button, also feel free to use the chat, uh, but if you put questions there, I might miss them. 
I do have a couple of quick polls as we're getting started. Uh, and so I just launched our first one. This is to give me a little bit of information about who I'm talking to. Uh, and so if you wouldn't mind uh, answering the first, this first question is, where are you joining from? And there are uh, a few options here. Just select the one that seems like it's the best fit for you. And I'll just give a few more seconds here. Great, looks like we're uh, mostly Portland and Willamette Valley, but we've got some folks a uh, little farther afield. Um, this uh, poll is anonymous and uh, optional, but we also collect demographics of our audience. Uh, and this is helpful for us uh, as we try to figure out who we're serving. There's a few questions, so I'll just leave this up for one minute here. And I'll give a few more seconds. Thank you guys so much. I'm gonna go ahead and end that. Uh, and we have one more poll before we get started. Uh, curious about your familiarity with a couple of incentives that are available for solar. And both of them are offered by Ener Energy Trust of Oregon. The first one is the solar, uh, their standard solar incentive. And the second one is called solar within reach. So uh, you can just answer yes, you're familiar, no, you're not, or you're not really sure. Maybe you think you heard of it. All right, I'm just gonna give a couple more seconds here. Looks like most folks are not familiar. So um, thank you for, for indulging me with the polls. Let's dive right into our webinar. So how does solar work? I'm gonna start off with a simple diagram of a solar system here that is a conceptual diagram. Uh, the Panel over here on the upper left, this labeled photovoltaic panel. This is a solar panel. This, you'll have multiple of these. They'll typically be on the roof, though sometimes they'll be on a ground mount. I'll show you that in a couple of slides. This is what we're talking about when we mean solar panels and the sunlight strikes the solar panel and it produces electricity. It's very simple. Uh, the one thing is about it is that solar produces a form of electricity called DC electricity. And all of the circuits in your home use a type of electricity called AC electricity. So in addition to these solar panels, you'll have uh, an electrical contraption here called an inverter, or you might have several microinverters. They all do the same thing. They just make that conversion from DC electricity to AC electricity. Once that conversion is performed, the electricity gets wired into your home electrical panel. That's your breaker box, maybe in your garage. And from there, the uh, solar energy goes to power, uh, the electricity goes to power all the circuits in your home, including your lights, your appliances. If you have an electric vehicle that you're charging, you can do that too. Uh, any excess electricity is going to go out through your utility meter and onto the utility grid. Uh, when you are uh, consuming more electricity than you're using, you can also still draw electricity from the utility grid and that will come in uh, through the utility meter again. Because the electricity is now flowing into and out of your home, when you go solar, you also get a special new type of utility meter called a bi-directional meter. And that allows you to measure the amount of electricity going out and then separately measure the amount of electricity coming in. And that is useful for uh, getting credit for the electricity that you're exporting to the grid. And that is a system called net metering that we'll talk about here in a second. But this is the uh, basic idea of how solar works. Like I said, very simple. Uh, and that's part of the reason why there's so little maintenance involved. 
Let's take a look at these special contraptions that perform that DC to AC uh, conversion. These are inverters or microinverters. So on the left, we have a picture of an inverter, and that's this white box here. Uh, you can see the conduit coming down from the solar system on the roof, uh, and then it's going to go into the electrical panel. Um, the uh, This is a great uh, uh, device. Uh, alternatively, you can get these microinverters. Here, we're looking on the right uh, at a uh, the underside of a solar system, and you'll see these little black boxes with the wires hanging off of them. Those are the microinverters, and you'll have one microinverter for every one or two solar panels. The difference between inverter and microinverter, uh, there are some uh, subtle trade-offs. These are both great technologies to use. They're both used very commonly. Uh, and typically, your solar installer will make a recommendation when they design your system for you, and you can ask them why they've made that recommendation. Uh, but these are both great products. Solar can be mounted in a couple of ways. Typically, it's mounted on the rooftop. It's a great place to put solar panels because otherwise your roof is just baking in the sun, and you might as well use that space to produce electricity. Roof mount is by far the most common way to install a net metered solar system for your home. If you are a little bit farther out of an urban center and you happen to have the ground space, you could consider a ground mount. A ground mount is a fine way to install solar. Uh, you obviously need to have the ground space for it. Uh, and in addition, you'll need to have your installer trench a copper wire between the system and your electrical panel because you're gonna have to make that connection. That trenching and that extra copper in the wire can increase the cost of a ground mount uh, a bit over a roof mount, especially if it's far away from your home. Uh, but these are, like I said, great options. That is uh, how you mount traditional and typical solar panels. I am going to talk for a slide here about solar roof tiles, which I would describe as sort of a niche technology. And this is different from what we think of when we think of solar panels. Uh, you'll see the image on the left here. Uh, you don't see any solar panels on this roof, uh, but that is, it's still producing electricity. And that's because the roof tiles themselves are doing that. Uh, this is something that's relatively speaking, a bit newer than solar panels. Uh, it's been around for a few years. You may have heard of it. We get lots of questions about it. Um, it could be a good solution, uh, but it is much, much less common. And I want to talk through a couple of the reasons uh, why that is and just give you an idea of where solar roof tiles are right now. Um, there are, uh, like I said, many fewer of these systems installed. Uh, there are several brands available of solar roof tile. Don't be thinking there's just one. Uh, they're typically uh, more expensive and partially that's because they are uh, a more complex technology that makes the installation process a bit longer. Um, and because they're a newer technology, the costs just haven't come down uh, quite as much as traditional solar panels. Uh, because they are such a niche technology, uh, traditional solar installation companies typically don't install them. You'll be hard pressed to find a solar installation company that stalls, installs them. You'll find you'll need to find a specialized company uh, that uh, that does this. Uh, I would say that if you are looking at solar roof tiles and you're seriously interested in them, uh, a couple things to consider. Uh, look for a team, ask them how many of these systems they've installed because a lot of the learning in the industry right now uh, is happening uh, in the installation phase and figuring out how to uh, get these things installed efficiently. Uh, and I think the more experienced the team is, the better. Uh, also, the price may not uh, decline in the near future. There have been some promises uh, made by the industry of you know near-term price declines. Uh, we're still waiting for those. Uh, those may happen in the future, but uh, don't want to speculate on that. Uh, so, uh, like I said, this could be a, a technology you might consider. However, the vast majority of solar is not this, and this webinar is not going to be about solar roof tiles in general. Now, uh, let's talk about net metering. When you have uh, solar panels installed, like I said, any excess energy, uh, you may be able to export and get credit uh, for that energy. 
Um, this is using a system called net metering. The way this works, I want to walk you through a couple of examples. One is of a typical sunny summer month, and the other is of a typical cloudy winter month. Um, and I'm going to walk you through these graphs. The orange bar is how much solar energy you produced during this typical sunny summer month on the left here. Uh, the blue bar is how much energy you have uh, consumed during that month. And so this difference here, this green arrow, is going to indicate how much net metering credit earned uh, during that month. So the great news is that you can use those credits to offset uh, electricity that you're purchasing from the grid, say, in a typical winter month. So if we move over to the graph on the right, uh, you'll see that the orange bar is much lower and you're actually consuming more energy in that month than you're producing. That's okay. Uh, you have this uh, amount that you're still buying from the grid, but you can use those rolled over credits. This is available for Pacific Power customers, Portland General Electric customers, and a number of uh, co-op customers. However, uh, if you're in one of the smaller, more rural utilities, uh, you'll need to check on that. The uh, one thing to note about net metering is that the credits roll over from month to month, but they don't roll over from year to year. What that means is that uh, when the net metering year begins on uh, April 1st, you'll start accumulating credits during the summer. You'll use those in the winter. Then on March 31st, if you have extra credits, those will be forfeited. That means that your system should be sized to uh, meet but not exceed your uh, predicted annual energy consumption needs. That's the gist of net metering. It's a really great system and enables you to take uh, advantage of a lot of value of your solar system. Let's take a look at what a net metering bill might look like. This is an example bill uh, from a net metering customer in Portland General Electric territory. You can see their meter and you can see uh, the start and end uh, reading for the consumption and the excess generation. So these are separate numbers. This is what your bi-directional meter allows you to track. Uh, then you are going to uh, be shown your total uh, credits earned or amount of electricity consumed. In this case, because it's negative, that means this person earned uh, 327 kilowatt hours of credit. That means their billable kilowatt hours of electricity is zero. So they're not going to be charged for any electricity. They're just going to gain that credit. And you can see how much credit they gained uh, through the course of this whole year. Uh, over on the right, you can see that they're still paying $12.63. Uh, you may uh, be surprised by that. The bulk of that is going to be your basic charge. That's what you pay just to be connected to the grid. And that is uh, what allows the uh, grid maintenance to occur, things like that. There are also a couple of minor taxes and fees, which you'll see as line items here. Uh, so that's what a net metering bill might look like. Uh, this would be in contrast to uh, say, you know, $100, $120 electric bill during this month. So uh, the difference between what you're paying with solar versus what you would be paying without solar uh, is one of the great benefits of solar. It allows you to save on your utility bill costs over uh, a long period of time, the lifetime of the system. So uh, let's take a look also here at system size. So uh, based on what I told you about net metering credits not rolling over from year to year, uh, that is the reason why your installer is going to size your system so that it meets but does not exceed your uh, annual electricity needs. The way they do that is they typically ask for a couple of your past utility bills uh, and extrapolate to, to say, oh, that's probably how much you'll need over the course of a year. They're really good at making these estimations. Uh, if you are planning on getting any kind of electric vehicle or a new appliance that's very uh, heavy in its electricity usage, uh, tell your installer that, and they can uh, you know, size your system based on your future expected needs. Other factors that might affect your system size are available space. Maybe your roof just isn't big enough to offset 100% of your energy, but you can do 70 80% offset. That's still a great system. Uh, maybe it's your budget. Maybe you want to save some roof space and just install a small solar system now. Uh, let your installer know if you're wanting to maybe 
uh, consider increasing your, your solar system later, uh, that might help in the design phase for them. Uh, the size of solar systems is measured in kilowatts. You don't have to worry about what that means. That's a technical jargony unit. Uh, but the average size system is about eight kilowatts in Oregon. However, system size vary widely. And so you can have a very small residential system and also a very large residential system. Um, and so that's going to be important when we talk about our example budgets uh, later on during the webinar. That's a basic overview of how solar works. So let's jump into the aspects of your home, the structure, the roof, uh, that will determine whether it's going to be easy for you to go solar. First thing I want to mention is that, of course, you need sunlight to be able to uh, take advantage of solar panels. This is an example uh, home with some solar panels, and you can see the compass rows underneath. These arcs with these orange beach balls, uh, that's the path of the sun, and you can see it's a little bit different in the summer versus the winter. However, the sun is always going to be in the southern sky because we're here in the northern hemisphere. That means that south facing roofs are ideal for solar. However, east facing and west facing roofs can also work great for solar. Uh, the only roof planes on which you consistently don't see solar panels being installed are north facing, northwest facing, and northeast facing. Sometimes east facing is right on the edge, and that's only because we have slightly misty mornings. Uh, but every, everywhere from southeast to due west is great for solar. But even if you have the perfect orientation of your roof, you can sometimes still be thwarted by big, beautiful trees or other tall objects around you. However, it can be hard to tell whether a tree is going to block the critical hours of sunlight on the part of your roof, uh, which is going to be best for solar panels. And so uh, don't despair too soon. Also, don't be surprised if you feel like you have a ton of wide open sky, but there's just that one tall redwood across the street that's going to block those critical hours of sunlight. Uh, solar companies are really good at assessing this for you. They can even uh, uh, assess it for the most part uh, on Google Maps. And then if they have any questions, they'll come out and take a look at your roof and take some measurements. Uh, but shade, of course, uh, can obstruct your ability to go solar. Uh, your roof is important in a number of ways. One is that uh, the ideal roof plan on which to install solar is uh, flat and you know one continuous area. Here are a couple of roof ex type examples that I've uh, labeled as complex. The roof on the left, you can see there's a lot of planes. It's a lot. It's a complex geometry, and uh, there isn't a great place to install a lot of solar panels right next to each other. Doesn't mean you couldn't install some solar panels there, but it's certainly going to be a smaller system than if you had a roof type like the home on the right, where you can see a great south facing roof plane. You do have this one dormer over the garage, but uh, there is a lot of continuous area here. And uh, the roof vents are all on the north facing side of the roof. And so they're not going to obstruct your solar panels there. In addition, and probably most importantly, uh, your roof condition. Uh, can determine whether you are easily able to go solar. And uh, the way, uh, uh, the reason this matters is because you're going to eventually have to re-roof your home. Uh, roofs have different lifetimes. There are different types of roofs. The composite shingle roof pictured here uh, might have a, a lifespan between 25 and 35 years, uh, maybe a little bit outside of that range. Um, uh, metal roofs might have a 50 year lifespan. Regardless, you want to have at least a 20 year lifespan because when you re roof, you're going to have to take your solar system off, do the re roofing, and then pay to have it reinstalled. That on installation, reinstallation is a service that your solar contractor can provide for you. Uh, in uh, most cases, if not, you can get another solar contractor to, uh, to do it. However, the uh, cost can be up to $10,000. And so you really want to make sure that your roof is going to last uh, long enough that you can 
uh, absorb the most of the benefit that your solar system is going to have. So solar systems are warranted for 25 years, typically. Um, and so uh, that's why we say uh, you want to have at least about 20 years uh, or more roof life left. If your roof is close to having to be uh, replaced, it is best to wait to go solar. And after you re-roof is the best time to go solar. Uh, so that's an ideal way to go solar. Lastly, I want to talk about what is underneath your roof. The uh, This is mostly important out, uh, sorry, inside Portland. Outside of Portland, this is a little bit less important. Uh, Portland has particularly strict structural code requirements for solar. And what we're looking at here is uh, what type of uh, structural com uh, configuration your roof has. So in the image on the left, there are trusses. You can see the support beams vertically and horizontally. The roof on the right just has rafters that go straight from the eaves to the crest. The You uh, can likely install solar whether you have trusses or rafters. However, uh, in Portland, uh, Sometimes you may need to hire an engineer. That's something your solar contractor will do for you. But they'll hire an engineer to run some calculations if you have rafters uh, to make sure that the span on the rafters is not too far. If you have trusses, you should be A-OK -okay no matter where you are. Those are typical on newer homes. So this is mostly older homes and particularly urban craftsman homes in Portland. Uh, if the engineer says, hey, your roof is fine, then that's all you have to do and you can proceed and get your permit. Uh, if the engineer comes back and says your span is too far, uh, you will have to perform some structural upgrades. This is also something your solar contractor can do for you. The engineering costs can be anywhere between two and three thousand dollars. The structural reinforcement costs can be anywhere between two and say seven thousand dollars. So you may be looking at up to an additional ten thousand dollars uh, for those reinforcements. Hopefully that gives you an idea of how to assess your home. Uh, contractors will do this for you. They'll, they'll give you a home assessment. So you don't have to be an expert, uh, but uh, that is often information that helps people assess their own homes. Um, let's talk now about solar plus battery storage. What we're focusing on here is the uh, occasions on which the grid goes down and your home loses power. There's a myth that solar uh, allows you to use electricity when the grid is down. However, that is not true unless you have a battery, some energy storage for your home. Uh, and uh, the uh, what happens when you have that solar plus storage system is that then you can use your power when your grid is down, and we refer to that as energy resilience. Uh, so here's an example of what I'm talking about, a battery in the garage, say, and some solar panels on the roof. Um, why might you think about energy resilience? How might you think about energy resilience? There's different types of power outages that you might expect here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and you, based on which one you're planning for, uh, your contractor may design a slightly different battery system for you or suggest a different battery system for you. The vast majority of short and frequent power outages are caused by storms and squirrels. Uh, those are uh, uh, frequent, they're short duration, and uh, they typically happen when you're a little bit farther toward the end of the line, so off in a more rural area. The uh, Those are easier to plan for, and batteries can be really great for these types of power outages. Other types of outages might include public safety power shutoffs. That is where a utility will shut off a whole section of their grid in order to prevent sparking a wildfire uh, with their utility infrastructure during especially hot and windy conditions. Those started cropping up in 2020 in Oregon, and uh, we had some last year as well. And I would expect that they, they are expected to be more frequent uh, in the future in Oregon. Uh, however, they'll be more frequent in certain areas like the Hood River area uh, and more rural areas uh, than in other areas. Uh, finally, we live in the Cascadia earthquake zone. 
Uh, and so uh, the earthquake is thought to uh, be likely to disrupt power in the Willamette area, uh, Willamette Valley area for up to around six weeks, which is an incredibly long outage and a difficult one to plan for. Uh, batteries are not going to typically be able to give you uh, anywhere near that type of protection uh, for a typical residential energy storage system. Um, however, if that's what you're planning for, talk to your contractor and they can tell you what you, uh, how you could be able to benefit from a battery system in that case. When it comes to picking a battery, there are many great products on the market. Uh, there are, sorry, there is a, ah, there we go. Got a window, my chat window was open. Uh, there are many, uh, many brands and chemistries. The vast majority of batteries installed in Oregon are going to be, uh, sorry, installed uh, for grid tied homes are going to be uh, lithium ion batteries. However, there are a couple of uh, categories of lithium ion chemistries. There's, for example, nick nickel manganese cobalt, uh, as well as lithium iron phosphate. Uh, they're both great battery chemistries. Uh, Nickel manganese cobalt might be a little lower cost in general. Lithium iron phosphate might be a little longer life, but you'll pay a little bit extra for it. Uh, a lot of these products are really great. Uh, however, if you want to compare different batteries from different brands, you might have to get quotes from multiple installers, which I would recommend anyway. Uh, but that is because installers may specialize in which brand they install. They may install one battery uh, brand or they may install two battery brands. Uh, Rare is the installer who will uh, tinker with more than uh, that number of batteries. Uh, you cannot mix and match components between brands, but you can mix and match components uh, within a single brand. So, for example, if you're considering multiple batteries from one brand, uh, and they have several different sizes of batteries, you might be able to mix and match those. The typical capacity of a storage system is nine to 14 kilowatt hours. And uh, there are also sometimes smaller units made around three kilowatt hours and larger units around 20 kilowatt hours. One other thing to think about is that if you are powering motors uh, or other appliances that require a lot of what's called surge capacity, and that is a, the amount of electricity they use right when they turn on. If that's very high, uh, uh, a lot of amperage, then you may have to get a battery uh, that is has a higher uh, surge capacity uh, to allow for that higher momentary amperage draw. When you're thinking about a storage system, uh, typically, when you have one battery, you're only going to be able to do what's called a partial home backup. And in this case, what's what you're what's happening is your uh, installation contractor is going to actually take some of the circuits in your breaker panel and move them over into a new panel and attach those to the battery. Everything else in your home, all the other circuits, are going to lose power still uh, when a when the grid goes down. That is in contrast to a whole home backup. Uh, which may require multiple batteries, typically two or three. Uh, of course, that extra uh, battery requirement uh, leads to extra cost because batteries are still relatively expensive. So you'll want to take that into account and make sure that you're uh, balancing your priorities. This is what that uh, separate breaker panel looks like when you get a partial home backup. It's called the essential loads panel. Uh, the breakers are moved to a new additional panel. You still have your old panel. Uh, and because this is uh, requires uh, work by a, a journeyman electrician, uh, that, that can increase the cost a little bit. However, partial home backups are still less expensive on the whole than whole home backups. So when you tell your contractor that you're interested in a uh, solar plus storage system, they're going to typically ask you uh, a number of questions, but the main balance here is between these two questions. What needs power and for how long? Uh, in a typical partial home backup, you're going to want to prioritize the things that you want to back up uh, that are most crucial. Typically, that's a refrigerator, uh, maybe some lights in common areas, and say in a couple of outlets to power computers and cell phones and other communication devices. 
uh, so you can work and talk. Uh, the more that you add to that list, obviously, the less time uh, you can expect your battery to be able to support all those additional appliances. Um, and so uh, talk to your contractor. It's really important to set your expectations about what your battery can and cannot do. Uh, and that can only happen through these in-depth conversations up front. Now, uh, one of the great things about solar and battery storage is that this is an incredibly customizable uh, technology. It's something that your contractor is going to design specifically for your site and for your needs. That means uh, that you're getting exactly what you need and only paying for what you need. Um, however, after your system is designed, adding on to your system uh, can be less efficient because your initial system design uh, didn't take into account any uh, additions of components later. Uh, for this reason, it can make a difference when you install a battery. There may be a lot of folks out there who already have solar who are interested in, you know, can I add a battery to my existing solar system? The answer is almost always yes. However, that can come at a little extra, little extra cost. Uh, you'll hear terms uh, called AC coupled versus DC coupled energy storage systems. When you install, install at the same time, you're more likely to get a DC coupled system. And when you install later, you're more likely to get an AC coupled system. You don't have to worry about what that means. Your contractor can talk you through all your design options. Uh, but just know that if you are fresh to solar and storage and you're uh, trying to make the decision, do I get solar and storage now, or uh, can I wait to get a battery? Uh, just know that you can save up to maybe roughly $10,000 by uh, adding storage to your initial system when it's initially designed. And finally, batteries, of course, do require space, just like uh, your solar inverter. And typically, like your solar inverter, your battery is best placed near your electrical panel, which is typically in your garage. You cannot put a battery in an enclosed space like a crawl space or a cupboard. Uh, however, you can install them outside if you don't have space in your garage. Just know that there can be a little extra cost and uh, some conduit run that might have to wrap around certain portions of your home. This is all governed by the National Electric Code, uh, which is, of course, here to keep you safe. Um, and so uh, the uh, it's just important to know uh, that this will require some space in your in your site. That's the basics of battery storage. Let's talk now about the incentives for uh, solar and storage. And then we'll talk about our uh, example budgets. The two main incentives that are available are in Oregon are the uh, solar investment tax credit. That is a federal tax credit. That's a dollar for dollar incentive. Uh, and there's also uh, incentives available for Energy Trust of Oregon customers. Again, those are customers of Pacific Power and Portland General Electric. Uh, so those incentives are not available uh, to folks uh, who are customers of rural co-ops. However, this does cover the vast majority of people in Oregon, uh, so it's likely to apply to you. The uh, investment tax credit is a 30% incentive. The standard solar incentive from Energy Trust is $500, and I'm going to talk in a couple slides about another incentive they have, which is much higher. Uh, first, a quick look at the tax credit. Uh, this is... Uh, something that is governed by tax law. And uh, for that reason, we strongly recommend that you only trust tax professionals uh, to answer your specific questions about the investment tax credit. Solar Oregon is not a tax professional. Uh, and so we are not here to, uh, to give you uh, definitive information or advice about the tax credit. That being said, here's some basics. Uh, this is, like I said, a 30% dollar for dollar incentive. That means 30% of your eligible project cost, which typically covers your entire project cost, um, is something that you can claim uh, and get a, get back dollar for dollar uh, as a reduction in your taxes. This applies to both solar panels and energy storage. Uh, that is new as of 2022 because of recent legislation. 
Uh, this can be claimed over multiple years. And so you don't have to have all the tax liability up front, but you do have to have tax liability in order to claim this uh, as a homeowner. Uh, this is uh, something that you file for yourself or you have a tax professional file for you and you use IRS forms 5695 and uh, in addition form 1040 schedule three. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, you can take a look at those forms online and get a sense of what that entails, uh, but there are, uh, it's a relatively simple process. The other Energy Trust of Oregon incentive that's available is called Solar Within Reach. Again, this is available to customers of Pacific Power and Portland General Electric. Uh, this is a much higher incentive. This is up to $6,000 for Pacific Power customers, up to $7,200 for Portland General Electric customers. It is income qualified. That means that you uh, need to earn less than a certain threshold income in order to take advantage of this. However, that threshold is relatively generous. For a household of four, the income threshold is $112,000. Uh, and you can find uh, the, a chart of uh, other thresholds based on your household size in the uh, links that I put in the chat at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, this is a great incentive uh, for solar. There is also an incentive that is uh, income uh, qualified for. Uh, solar and storage. And this is offered through the state of Oregon, the Oregon Department of Energy. This applies to anybody, regardless of what your utility customer is. The uh, incentive is up to $5,000 for solar and up to $2,500 for uh, energy storage. Because the remaining funds are only here for income qualified customers, uh, you're likely to max out that incentive, uh, regardless of your system size. One note is that this uh, storage portion of this incentive only applies to a uh, battery that is installed at the same time as your solar. So it does not apply to a battery installed after the fact. Before we jump into our example budgets, I just want to uh, summarize a couple of the reasons why costs vary. So I'm going to show you this example budget. However, your uh, quoted systems that you'll receive from uh, contractors may vary widely from what I'm presenting in the example budget. Uh, for solar, this uh, may be because of your system size. It may be because you have re-roofing needs. It might be because you uh, need structural analysis and or reinforcements for your roof. Uh, and it might be because you have a varying access to incentives. For energy storage, uh, the costs may vary uh, based on whether you're installing your battery at the same time as your solar or later. Uh, the number of batteries you're going to install is going to uh, change your, your quoted price substantially. Uh, the uh, partial home backup, the additional labor involved in an essential loads panel uh, is also going to increase some cost. Um, and uh, and placement of your battery. If your battery is placed far away from your electric panel, that can also cause the cost to vary uh, slightly, uh, as well as the, your access to incentives. So uh, that said, the uh, let's take a look at an example budget for solar. Uh, we are going to walk through four examples here. Uh, and two of them are for Pacific Power, two of them are for Portland General Electric. You can see these columns here. Uh, in the slide, the uh, ones labeled uh, LMI, that is where you're, you have access to incentives uh, based on whether you are income qualified. Uh, the ones that are not labeled LMI uh, means you don't have access to those incentives. So we are assuming an eight kilowatt solar system uh, and the initial cost uh, before incentives is going to be $32,000. Uh, in all four of these cases. For uh, Pacific Power and Portland General Electric, uh, that's going to be $500 for the Energy Trust of Oregon incentive. Uh, for uh, Pacific Power and Portland General Electric, uh, sorry, for Pacific Power, it's $6,000 uh, for the Solar Within Reach incentive, $7,200 uh, for Portland General Electric customers. Uh, you're going to receive the $5,000 uh, state of Oregon rebate 
um, if you are income qualified and uh, not uh, in the other cases. This is going to result in an out-of-pocket cost to customer of uh, either $31,000 roughly or around $20,000. That's what you're going to pay out of pocket. Your contractor uh, is going to apply for these first two incentives for you and receive those and pass those on to you. So you don't have to take uh, responsibility for any of that paperwork. Uh, what you will have to apply for, again, is the federal tax credit. Uh, in these cases, uh, it will be around $9,000 um, or roughly around $6,000 if you're income qualified. Uh, and that's going to result in a final uh, net cost to you of, uh, of these prices shown here, either $22,000 or roughly $14,000. The, uh, of course, after the system is installed, you're going to experience your energy savings and at a certain point, your system is going to pay itself off. And so uh, this is the initial upfront installation cost. Um, however, the savings are, are not factored into that. Your, uh, let's take a look now at a sample budget for solar plus storage installed at the same time. Uh, so I'm not gonna run through uh, all of the incentives in the same detail. Uh, but we're assuming here an eight kilowatt solar system and a 10 kilowatt hour battery storage system. That would be a single battery. Uh, and the cost before incentives we're going to assume is around $44,000. The uh, solar incentives uh, and battery incentives are applied here, resulting in out of pocket costs to the customer of uh, roughly still about $44,000, uh, 43500 uh, or if you're income qualified, it might be taken down um, by uh, ten to twelve thousand uh, dollars. After you claim your federal tax credit, uh, the final uh, net cost of the system is going to be roughly around thirty thousand, or if you're income qualified, roughly around twenty thousand. And finally, let's walk through an example of uh, a system. Uh, where you install solar in one year, and then say the next year you install a battery. Uh, this is again, we're assuming an eight kilowatt solar system and a 10 kilowatt hour uh, storage system. The cost of solar, uh, we're gonna assume to be roughly $32,000. The cost of the battery after the fact is going to be roughly around $23,000. And uh, after the incentives, this is going to result in a total out-of-pocket customer cost. Uh, so that's going to be for both the battery and the solar, even though they're separate jobs of around um, either 54,000 or 42 to 44,000. Uh, after the tax credit is applied, uh, this is brought down to roughly around 40,000 or roughly around 30,000. Uh, so you can see that there is a difference installing a, a battery at the same time versus installing a battery later on. Hopefully these slides are useful to, uh, to you. Um, these, again, these are, uh, these figures should be taken with a grain of salt um, and you will only really know what it's gonna cost you when you get quotes from companies. Because there is a lot of upfront cost in installing solar and storage, financing is relatively common. There are uh, credit unions and other uh, brokers who provide uh, products that are specifically tailored to solar uh, that allow you to refinance once you have uh, claimed your tax credit. Uh, and in that way, uh, you'll be able to receive a lower interest rate for the remainder of your financing period. Um, however, you can also go to your bank, maybe you have an existing relationship uh, and you could attach it uh, to uh, line of credit with your mortgage. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, treat this as you would any other uh, important financial decision. It's important to, to read through uh, the fine print and make sure you understand uh, what your, fin your financing uh, package entails. That being said, this is a great tool for a lot of homeowners. So, uh, that is an overview of the incentives and the uh, cost of solar and storage. The, uh, let's talk a little bit about how you get started. 
And the first thing uh, I want to cover is how to select a good contractor. There is a great service provided by Energy Trust of Oregon in which they certify solar contractors, uh, and we call these trade allies of Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, these companies have been rigorously uh, qualified and approved to offer the Energy Trust incentives. Other contractors cannot offer those Energy Trust incentives. So especially if you want to take advantage of solar within reach, uh, would highly suggest a trade ally. Uh, but just in general, uh, this certification uh, should mean something to you because uh, these folks have been determined to be of uh, high quality by Energy Trust. So um, this is a, a great way to, uh, to start, is looking for trade allies. There's an awesome online tool provided by Energy Trust of Oregon uh, that allows you to uh, fill out a form, simple three to five minute form, uh, enter your address, your name, your contact information, and you will get contacted by three randomly selected high quality uh, trade ally contractors that serve your area. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pop these links back in the chat. The um, link labeled Energy Trust Solar Bid Tool. If there's one link that you were to save from this webinar, it should be this link. And uh, that's energytrust.org slash solar bid. Excuse me. The uh, it's very easy to use, so make sure that you keep track of that. And when you're ready to get quotes, it's a great place to start. Uh, what does installation look like? Uh, well, solar is a uh, it's what's called a turnkey service. So when you have gotten your quotes from your contractors, uh, you've decided which contract you're ready to, to move forward with, uh, you sign the contract. At that point, uh, they will do everything, uh, including filing for permitting, uh, designing your system, uh, applying for your initial incentives, uh, and uh, uh, communicating with your utility company. Um, the uh, initial permitting stage can take a little bit of time, and it can vary depending on where you are uh, and whether there are certain backlogs in the building department in your local jurisdiction. Uh, however, permitting might take as little as two months or up to, say, 12 months. Um, but you're not uh, uh, having to do anything during that time. It's mostly just waiting for you. Uh, the uh, When you've received your permits, uh, your installation uh, will get uh, thrown up on the construction calendar. Uh, installation is typically just one to two days for solar, uh, so it's relatively quick and painless. Uh, and after installation, there will be a period of a couple of weeks in which your uh, utility, sorry, your uh, contractor is coordinating with your utility to perform interconnection um, and then turning on your system and closing out your uh, permit inspections through your local jurisdiction. At that point, uh, your system will be powered on and you'll be producing clean renewable energy with your solar panels on your rooftop or ground mount. So that is the uh, how to get started with solar. Um, I'm uh, really glad that all of you joined us today. And uh, so I think we are right about at 12.50. Uh, I'm going to stay on and answer our uh, Q&A questions, as many questions as you guys have. So please feel free to, uh, to load up the Q&A button with uh, questions. Uh, I'm going to launch one last survey here, which is our uh, post-event survey. Really appreciate your quick feedback on whether this uh, workshop was useful to you. So let's go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Uh, Matt asks, how does your house know how much power to draw in from the grid when you're also generating solar power? Is there an extra device needed to determine this when installing a solar setup? That's a great question. Uh, it's a little bit of a technical question. So the uh, way in which your home draws electricity from the grid is uh, essentially based on the amount of resistance in your circuitry. So I don't wanna get uh, too wonky, but uh, when you turn something on, uh, when, when there are no circuits on in your home, uh, it's as if there are there's a drawbridge up and electricity can't flow through. 
so every device that is built in your home, so you have an appliance like a refrigerator, when that turns on, it's essentially like it's opening a gate uh, that was formerly closed. And the device itself, in this case, your refrigerator, is built to limit the amount of electricity that goes through it. So this is actually uh, inherent to how all of the devices used by your circuits in your home operate and were designed. Uh, but there's actually no special uh, box or, or special gadget needed to determine uh, how much your home is drawing. Uh, it's actually, that's gone into the design of every single electrical component in your home. Holman asks, installers ask to agree slash sign proposal before doing site survey. Is this normal? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the uh, It is not uncommon. Uh, so the question here is basically about how do contractors assess your home and generate an initial proposal? There are a couple of general flavors of how this happens. One is what I would characterize as the uh, old school way. Uh, and uh, that's not to say that it's... Uh, uh, not good or bad, but that is that a contractor will come to your home, climb up on your roof, uh, get out a tape measure, take measurements, and use a special device to measure uh, the skyline and the amount of electricity, or sorry, energy, sunlight that might uh, reach different parts of your roof. Uh, they will use that information to generate an initial uh, system design, uh, and then they will uh, uh, take a look at your electrical components too as part of that and then they will hand that to you once you sign it uh that you're uh pretty guaranteed uh to have that be your actual system design uh the what i would call a newfangled approach uses uh special software that incorporates satellite data uh that take a look at your home and the uh solar potential from using satellites in space uh, and these are special uh, software packages that uh, solar companies use to create the initial system design. However, they're not coming to your home and taking exact measurements, and they're not coming to your home and uh, uh, measuring the, uh, the skyline exactly. Um, and so there's a little bit more error in that process, but it's pretty accurate, and they can uh, very commonly design a system initially that is what they're going to install uh, generally for you. However, uh, in the case where a company uses uh, that approach and they don't actually come to your home before giving you a proposal, um, you may sign your contract uh, and in the contract, uh, it will stipulate that uh, they will generate a full system design for you. They may need to come to your home and take some measurements, take a look at, at certain aspects of your uh, electrical setup in your roof. Um, and if anything is different from what they assumed based on the satellite data, then they would draw up a different system design and uh, you would have an option to accept or reject that. Um, just be careful uh, to make sure that, there, that uh, you can reject a uh, change to the system design uh, when you sign your initial proposal, but that's not an uncommon way of doing business and, uh, and it is relatively normal. Uh, I'm going to cycle through these here. So uh, Sparkle asks, uh, do you have home designers that plan for uh, solar power? So I think the question here is about uh, architects and folks who design homes. Are they thinking about solar when they design the home? That's a great question. Um, there are uh, a couple of ways in which people have uh, tried to address this aspect. So obviously what we walked through regarding uh, your site conditions and your roof, uh, you may have taken away uh, the fact that uh, there are aspects of your home that could be optimized better, even in the design phase for solar power. Uh, that's certainly the case and uh, even comes in the case with landscaping where trees are planted. Um, there are designers who pay attention to that and they uh, specifically build homes that are optimized for solar. It's a relatively rare thing uh, in the whole home building market. Uh, there are uh, efforts occasionally to put that into code. Uh, there was a rulemaking process in Oregon in 2020 uh, to create residential solar ready codes. Uh, however, those codes uh, didn't incorporate any 
uh, requirements regarding roof orientation. And so I would call them weak solar ready codes in Oregon. There are jurisdictions, uh, you know, states like California that have uh, stronger solar ready codes. But um, uh, but there are some home designers who focus on that regardless. Uh, Matt's got a second question here. Uh, what happens if you generate more power than you're using and you don't have a, a battery and you don't have a bi-directional meter set up? Well, uh, you're going to almost, well, you're going to typically get a bi-directional meter when you go solar if you are grid tied. Uh, and that is if you have net metering available to you. So that's that system where you can get credit for those excess kilowatt hours you put up on the grid. Um, your utility, uh, I think it's unlikely that, I don't know the, the specific rules for all the utilities in Oregon because there's a lot of smaller co-ops. Um, but the utility also regulates whether you can interconnect to your solar system, to the grid, uh, through the interconnection process. So uh, solar designers design your system with a bi-directional meter in mind and uh, with the assumption of uh, following all the rules of interconnection. Uh, if you were to not have a bi-directional meter, I'm not sure if there are any utilities that allow that, uh, but I would think that that would be relatively uncommon. Hopefully that answers your question. Feel free to ask another one if it didn't. Uh, Rick asks, can most solar contractors also combine in wind turbines to their system? Uh, the answer, the short answer to that is no. Uh, the vast majority of solar contractors uh, focus only on solar. And uh, I'm not even sure that I've encountered a solar contractor in Oregon uh, that focuses on residential systems that also incorporates wind turbines there are uh, companies I've seen in California that design microgrids that involve wind and solar, but that's only in the commercial market uh, for commercial rooftops. Um, certainly, micro wind is a technology. I think that uh, the, the Willamette Valley has a uh, relatively mild wind resource, and so I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of market for it for that reason, too. However, you may find a company uh, that could offer you that if you're interested. That is all the questions I've got so far. So unless something comes in in the next uh, few seconds here, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you guys so much uh, for joining us. We This is recorded. I'm going to send out an email to you all with a link to the recording on YouTube. Uh, and feel free to get in touch. Uh, with me directly at my email, zachs at solaroregon.org, which was in the chat. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to answer other questions as you're navigating your solar journey. So seeing no questions, I'll go ahead and close it out. Uh, thanks again and have a great day.